A reading from the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians. Brothers, there is to be sure a certain wisdom which we express among the spiritually mature. It is not a wisdom of this age, however, nor of the rulers of this age, who are men headed for destruction. No, what we utter is God's wisdom, a mysterious, a hidden wisdom. God planned it before all ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age knew the mystery. If they had known it, they would never have crucified the Lord of glory. Of this wisdom it is written, eye has not seen, ear has not heard, nor has it so much as dawned on man what God has prepared for those who love him. Yet God has revealed this wisdom to us through the Spirit. The Spirit scrutinizes all matters even the deep things of God. Who for, who, for example, knows a man's innermost self, but the man's own spirit within him? Similarly, no one knows what lies at the depths of God, but the spirit of God. The spirit we have received is not the world spirit, but God's spirit, helping us to recognize the gifts he has given us. We speak of these not in, human, not in words of human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, thus interpreting spiritual things in spiritual terms. Fabum Domini. like the splendor of the firmament 
and those who lead the many to justice shall be like the stars forever. Dominus Fobiscum. Et Lexio Sancti Evangelii Secundum Matthäum. Jesus said to his disciples, You are the salt of the earth, but what if salt goes flat? How can you restore its flavor? then it is good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Men do not light a lamp and then put it under a bushel basket. They set it on a stand where it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, your light must shine before men so that they may see goodness in your acts and give praise to your heavenly Father. Do not think I have come to abolish the law and the prophets. I have come not to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Of this much I assure you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter of the law, not the smallest part of a letter, shall be done away with until it all comes true. That is why whoever breaks the least significant of these commands and teaches others to do so shall be called least in the kingdom of God. Whoever fulfills and teaches these commands shall be great in the kingdom of God. Verbum Domini. Today, the Franciscan family is celebrating the Feast of St. Bonaventure, and I would encourage all of you to go to the Vatican website and uh, do a little research on our Holy Father's general audiences that he uh, delivers every Wednesday. And in March of 2010, our Holy Father, Pope Benedict XVI, dedicated three general audience conferences to presenting the person and sanctity of St. Bonaventure. And as he began that series of conferences, he said, I confide to you that in broaching this subject, I feel a certain nostalgia, for I am thinking back to my research as a young scholar on this author who was particularly dear to me. My knowledge of him had quite an impact on my formation. And so the saint today had quite an impact on the formation, intellectual and spiritual formation, of our present Holy Father. And he was a Franciscan. <laughs> and so that what is what endears us uh, to him. He lived in the 13th century. We believe he was born around the year 1217, and he died in 1274, and so his life shortly overlapped the life of uh, St. Francis. And his name in birth was Giovanni, or John, uh, but he received this name Bonaventure in religious life. And it is really tied to uh, something that is viewed as something that was good, a gift of goodness um, that happened while he was still a child. He was a little boy and he fell seriously ill. And his own father, who was a doctor, had given up hope of saving him from death. They thought this little boy was going to die. But the mother of St. Bonaventure pleaded and begged with St. Francis of Assisi, who had recently been canonized, and this little boy recovered. Now his parents did not immediately say, now you must go and become a Franciscan. Rather, 
he grew up, he went off to university, and he actually received uh, quite a respectable uh, graduate uh, degree. And he, like many young men, asked the question at that point, well, what am I supposed to do with the rest of my life? And he was in Paris at that time, and who came into uh, the town or who he witnessed was these Franciscan friars. And he was very impressed by their fervor and their evangelical life, their life of the gospel. And later he would explain that the reason for his decision, so he went and tried to follow, imitate them, knocked on their door and asked for acceptance into the order of Friars Minor. But later on he would explain that the reason for his decision is that he recognized the action of Jesus in St. Francis and in this movement that he had founded. In a letter that he addressed to another friar, he wrote this. He said, I confess before God that the reason which made me love the life of blessed Francis most is that it resembled the birth and early development of the church. The church began with simple fishermen and was subsequently enriched by very distinguished and wise teachers. The religion of blessed Francis was not established by the prudence of men, but by Christ. And so this uh, was something that he found attractive. The men that he would have been seeing as a young man were some of these early followers of St. Francis, who were like the simple fishermen that Christ called to follow him. St. Bonaventure was going to be one of these uh, rather distinguished teachers who would be called to the Franciscan order and is known as a, a great, a very wise man and a brilliant teacher and a great guide for the Franciscan order. Uh, he, in the year 1257, was elected as the minister general of the Franciscan order and in that capacity, uh, he served in that capacity for 17 years and in what he did as the minister general, he earned the title or the honor of being considered the second founder of the Franciscans. St. Francis had died in the year 1226, and here's Bonaventure becoming the minister general a little over 30 years later, and the order of friars minor had reached already more than 30,000 friars scattered throughout the West. They had missionaries in North Africa, the Middle East, and even in Peking. Now, anything that grows that fast is going to be a little bit kind of top-heavy or get a little bit dizzying, and that's what St. Francis was stepping into. He recognized the need to consolidate this expansion and to bring a unity to all of these different friars. What he was facing is that there was a very uh, likely chance of an internal split that would happen among the followers of St. Francis. And so he wanted to identify clearly the charism of St. Francis and to try to unite the effort and the life of these friars. Now, if you read the history of the Franciscan order, some of these people were quite the characters. You know, they had all kinds of ideas and going in thousands of different directions, just like Franciscans today, who are not as uh, focused as the Dominicans or the Jesuits. We're wild, you know, and they're kind of like these uh, ideas that are, are happening. The Holy Spirit is moving actively among uh, Franciscans, you might say. But St. Bonaventure is recognizing this and seeing that all that uh, happened by the, this call, this grace that the Lord had given to St. Francis, all of these men coming to follow his way of life, that that could be destroyed or run the risk of destruction. And so he regulated the daily life of the friars, and he encountered opposition in doing that. And yet he really was establishing them in the church and giving, helping to give an identity 
to the Franciscan order as a legitimate religious community operating in the, within the church. And he did this, yes, through legislative measures, but he also recognized that it was necessary for all of these followers of Francis to have uh, a shared ideal and motivation, that they needed to have an authentic understanding of the charism of St. Francis, of his life and of his teaching. And so as he traveled around among the different provinces of Franciscans, he spoke especially to those who had lived with St. Francis who had met him and who knew him. And he created or wrote uh, this biography of St. Francis. We call it the major legend, but don't be confused by that word legend, but really the authoritative life of St. Francis of Assisi. And this has served the Franciscan order so well throughout the ages. It was in his writing of this life of St. Francis that he went up to Laverna, to the place where St. Francis had received the stigmata. And he was reflecting on uh, these powerful things that the Lord had done in the life of St. Francis. And a friend of his by the name of St. Thomas Aquinas, who had respect for Bonaventure, was passing through that region. And he decided to stop and to visit St. Bonaventure. Now when you go to Mount Laverna today, there's a, a friary or a monastery there, and there is a cell that they have preserved where St. Bonaventure was there praying and writing this life of Francis. And when St. Thomas Aquinas was brought to that cell, they pushed the door open and St. Bonaventure had been caught up in ecstasy. And St. Thomas told those who brought him there, let us go and leave one saint reflect on the life of another saint. And so he already recognized the sanctity of St. Bonaventure. Another clever little story, we know that uh, he was named as a bishop and they brought the uh, the bishops or named as a cardinal. They brought the cardinal's hat to him and supposedly he was uh, washing the dishes or helping to wash dishes. And to show his detachment from such things, he simply said to the delegate of the Holy Father, well, hang that hat up over there on that tree and I'll get it later. Now most of us would, give that to me. <laughs> you know, I don't need to be washing the dishes. I need to be wearing this beautiful red hat, you know. But it shows that he's a real follower of St. Francis, that detachment from such worldly recognition or titles. And we're told as he guided the uh, followers of St. Francis that it wasn't just in ways that were legislative or by rules, but that he was concerned about the uh, spiritual well-being of these men and that his decisions uh, they say at the root of his government, this was what the Holy Father said, at the root of his government, we always find prayer and thought. All his decisions are the result of reflection, of thought illumined by prayer. And this is very difficult for priests today. It's very difficult for bishops. It's very difficult for religious superiors. That it's so easy, especially with the a smaller number of those following uh, the call of the Lord is that priests and religious can get caught up in administration or this legislative type of work and that we can forget about uh, the spirit that needs to go along with that. Um, this sense of being at the service of the others and their spiritual well-being. Uh, I know for myself at times you have to really kind of beat yourself and say enough with the paperwork, enough with the administration, and go to the chapel. You're trying to figure out what to do. You know, here are brothers coming to you with all kinds of questions. Yes, you apply your mind and you seek to uh, 
reasonably respond to their questions or their concerns. But there are some things that we can't do on just a human level. You need to turn to the Lord and say, look, this is not my problem. These men belong to you. You know, they're called by you. I have no idea what it is that you have in mind for them. And guide us by your Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Give us your light. And pastors do this in their parishes with their people. You know, the, the, the difficulties and the problems in life that uh, the flock of Christ bring to the pastors over and over and over. And so many priests simply go to their churches, and God bless them. They kneel down sometimes in exasperation, I'm sure, and just say, look, Lord, these are your sheep. These are your people. And yes, I have to apply my ability, my ingenuity. I must, uh, in, in reflection and thought, guide and direct them. But really, it needs to be in prayer, in prayerful reflection, that we know that the Holy Spirit guide and direct his flock. And I think this is where we can look at Pope Benedict and see what he said about St. Bonaventure, the influence that this saint had on his life. Because isn't this how he shepherds the flock of Christ? How he guides the church? That in his brilliant mind, he teaches us. He administers all of the concerns of the church. But he in himself is such a man of deep prayer. And we can see in his guidance, in uh, his direction for the church, the working and the power of the Holy Spirit. Every one of us is willing to follow his guidance or the words, the counsel he offers us because we can see that it's not just from him, but that it comes from God himself. To conclude, St. Bonaventure is a doctor of the church and he's called the seraphic doctor, or the doctor of love. And many times people like to set St. Thomas Aquinas and St. Bonaventure in opposition to one another. Remember, they knew each other and they had great respect for each other. But in this question that these men as philosophers and theologians would ask, they pondered what is the man's final goal? What is man's complete happiness? And they approached that in ways that, in a way that was very similar and yet had a slight distinction. For St. Thomas Aquinas, the supreme end to which our desire is directed is to see God, that we behold God face to face. But for St. Bonaventure, the ultimate destiny of the human being is to love God. And he would have gotten this from uh, St. Francis himself. St. Francis, who was wished to be like the, the seraphim, caught up completely in the love of God. And so for St. Bonaventure, we can reflect on that today, that our final destiny as, as men is to love God, to encounter him, and to be united in his and our love. For St. Bonaventure, this is the most satisfactory definition of our happiness, to love God.